Okay, so, um, we're going to take a look at some form studies first to help prepare our minds to think in geometries, to think in, in forms. I did want to do more form studies at the head of the class, um, like at the start of the class, do more form studies so that we can have a little bit, uh, a little bit more focus there. Um, I'm sorry if I mess around and not like say the right words or be at a loss for words. I'm in a, a little bit of discomfort, but let's get started. So right here, the problem with these forms, the point of the form studies is that we're thinking in geometries, we're thinking in planes. So form studies teach you how to think in planes. That means that we're avoiding gradients, we're avoiding radial shading, we're avoiding overblending. We're just thinking in basic shapes. So that means we've got to get rid of some of these these flip flappy little these values here that you've got a, you know got a little bit of everything going on which isn't good so what we have to do is again one the reason why form studies are so wonderful is they uh, help you gain some really good habits and one of these habits is deciding where the light source is asking yourself where is the light source <coughs> so if the light source is coming seeing the way this is shining and this is kind of dark and the light source is kind of coming in this way so uh, this one's not following the light source this this one was it was a little confusing but I'm gonna make up my own okay so I'm just using the let me see I have to start doing this I'm using the dry oil brush too in my dry oil brush brushes <laughs> right now um, and that's what I'm using here to introduce this value. Okay. So I'm deciding on the very light plane, the lightest most plane. And the reason why, and I'm avoiding using gradients, the reason why is because it will work as a reference point for the other values I'm going to decide on. <coughs> just going to go to this value right here. If it's too light, it's okay. We just go to the, we just continue onward and we'll darken it when we need to. Right now your lights are too light and your darks are too dark. But we're just responding to the light source here. And again, we're thinking about this as planes, not gradients. Why do we not want to use gradients on these planes? Can anyone answer the question? Anyone explain why it's bad for your form study practice to use too many gradients on these surfaces? All right, so again, we're deciding on the lightest value. So this one's going to be closer to the light source um, than this one. So this is going to be much less because the because the plane will look rounded. Um, they remove the edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, darks kind of get too mu uh, much too black too soon. Yes, because the surfaces are flat. Thank you, Tom. Tom is just Tom is just the light of our life here in this community, because the surfaces are flat, and the reason why um, we want to keep the values flat as one single value. Stop! Stop! First of all, stop with the gradients. A gradient, a gradient, and another gradient over here. Uh, this, these surfaces are flat. The reason why we want to have these flat surfaces in our form studies is because they teach us to find the flat surfaces in the full poly faces in these and and when we have when we have a really really complicated lighting situation we really want to get to breaking it down what we do is we, we we decrease it in different planes so that we know what to do with our brush this is guiding our brush the more gradients we have the more we're going to confuse ourselves in the greater picture so why are we still bringing the whole gradient thing back into form studies? This is supposed to be about seeing less gradients. So forms help you see less gradients. Write that back to me. They help you see the forms that are there, the actual forms. The actual geometries, and geometries are a bunch of flat surfaces, and when we're talking about blobs, it's a whole other story with blobs. So stop with, the, with, with these... Uh, Sorry, I blanked out. Stop with these <laughs> gradients, okay? Um, so again, we're moving into this value right here. Okay, so I lightened the background. 
I mean, I'm going to lighten the background now, but I lighten the darkest dark. <clears throat> and I'm throwing that into some value over here. And the reason why I want to do that is because I'm trying to explain that all this value is coming out of somewhere, some kind of source. The source is universal. So this one's going to get darker. This one's going to be just a little lighter. And this is all about finding those planes, finding those those just uh, basic surface areas. We're trying to see less gradients. And what happens when a student sees too many gradients or uses too many gradients? Can anyone answer? Why are gradients so dangerous? Why is excessive dependency on gradients so dangerous? What does it have to do with blending? What does it do to the way you see blending? Does anyone have an idea of why it's so problematic? <clears throat> we love you here. We won't let the sickness be too without our strongest resistance. I wish I could shrink all of you like Stewie. You know how Stewie Griffin shrinks himself and goes inside the body and like kills the, I don't know. I'll shrink you all into little soldiers, and you can just go in and find what's causing the trouble and beat it up. Because they distract you from... Sentence kind of just disappeared there, Grace. <laughs> there we go, from the form. <laughs> Part of your sentence just got, like, abducted. <laughs> it's just cut. The form is hard to read because they make you lose edge. Mm, it's not so much the edge, Kina. Rounds everything, mm-hmm, overcomplicated because the objects will lose shape, no edges, messes up your edges, because then we overblend. Exactly, Carolina. 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 Um, we overblend. They teach the student that all you really have to do is make a gradient in this general vicinity, and then you'll pull it off and it'll look like a real object. The point is we're eventually going to blend all of these forms together. We're going to blend, we're going to get a gradient, we're going to blend the cheek with the chin, right? We're going to blend this out eventually, but the point is we're not blending it out with a too large blending brush. We're still keeping some of the edge intact. All right, we don't need a gradient here. We don't need a gradient here. This is where we get that mini miniature little gradient. The point was finding these planes and helping you draw better, right? So enough with these gradients everywhere all over your form studies. That, that's not the point. The point is that we're finding the planes in between all the madness of of these uh, high poly references, whatever it is that you're trying to work with. If it's a reference, if it's a, uh, someone else's art and you're trying to deconstruct their style, if you're trying to transfer from line to, to, to full form, you have to find the planes and the solid gradient, not the solid values, not the gradients. And the gradients will eventually emerge either with radial values, radial gradients, this is what we're supposed to be doing. The form study teaches us how to think about the light source. Where is the light source coming from? It makes us choose better values per plane, per surface area. It makes us think about the light environment and the role the background plays in the, in the value and the depth of all these shadows. Too dark, too dark, too dark. As soon as we lighten the value up to match the amount of contrast we have here, look at this exposure. The background should have been this light. But too dark. It's like you've got paint and only painted this side in. We want values that we paint in that actually look like, um, you know, they belong to this object, that they're from the same value, they're from the same palette. It, can get, it gets to be dark, just not black, and not outside of its local value. All right, all of these areas here, they get to be dark, it's just they don't get to be pure black. What, how did the light environment allow it if the light environment was exposed to this much light? And how did this object afford that deep a drop? If it was this light, an object who was a light gray object. And everything you're going to paint is going to be light gray or something similar to a light gray. <clears throat> so I'm just going over here and getting rid of some of this excessive contrast. You had edge work, but the reason why you, I'm not sure what made you want to work in these gradients, what reference you were looking at, but um, because maybe your edges were also a little bit. Uh, out of place and the reason why that is is it's just not optional you have a pyramid you have an edge because this is the vertice it's visible the angle is right there telling us there should have been an edge but here you are over blending it again that's the point of a form study is that we're not doing this stuff anymore and we have a solid a nice solid value right here to help us express this angle which we see as a silhouette 
has an actual shade difference. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry if this sounds stupid, but what's an Asaro head? Asaro head, just Google it. Uh, it's just a really low plane, uh, low poly uh, bust of a head and the shoulders, and it just shows you where all the basic areas that look up or look down or away from the light source. <clears throat> you see, I, I feel like a lot of you do understand what I say, what I, when I, when, what I mean when I say, you know, areas that look up or look down, planes and surface areas. But I have met students who aren't even just, not even just because they're beginners, but because they just don't think like this. They have no idea what I mean when I say areas that look up and look down. So as a, as a precaution, I'm going to explain it. Um, in, re in the real world, what we see are either, you know, what we remember, a cube, we remember it as a square. And you just have to identify yourself. Where are you right now? Are you remembering cubes as squares or actual cubes? Do you see the form? So this is what I mean when an area looks down, looks forward, and looks up. So we try to find these funny little surfaces here when we're working with noses or full portraits. We find the cube version of all of these areas, and we find the areas that look up and look down. And we always imagine in a light source situation, all of these have little arrows sticking out of them, telling us where they look. Where they look is whether or not they're exposed to the light source, whether or not they'll be in shadow or highlight. And again, if you have this, if you have this issue, if you don't have this little clean little progression in your thinking process, this is not going to be in your drawing process. What your thinking process is is reflected in your drawing process. So identify it. Are you a person who has issues seeing a square, seeing a cube? As a cube, do you only see squares? If you see a square, you see an eye as a symbol. Uh, you see the body as a general symbol. You don't really see form and gesture. Um, you see a nose as a, as a symbol of a nose instead of an actual pyramid or a square pyramid. Um, so you have to be able to diagnose yourself and know what you have to do. Almost always, though, just as a rule of thumb, I don't know if you believe me yet or not, but... Um, whether or not you agree, you probably do have form problems. You probably do need a couple of form studies in your life. And I, I congratulate whoever did this. I congratulate you for attempting them because you have identified one of the biggest issues that you have. You have form issues and you have blending issues and you have some, some basic, um, uh, just like uh, light lighting fundamental issues like understanding lighting. And how all of these vertices, the, you chose these little points, not me. I didn't bring these in. When we have a curved edge, when we have a curved side, we can we can understand why you would have chosen gradients because everything is a blob and everything is some kind of gradient, right? But you didn't. You chose really severe angles with your lasso tool. This means that there were edges somewhere around here. There were some real edges happening. Okay? So a vertice means there's an edge. All right, write that back to me. I feel like this area should be a little bit lighter and the background should be a little bit lighter still or or something like that. But this is a nice, safe environment, nice, safe light background color, and a nice, safe, you know, everything here. All right. The vertex means there is an edge, and an edge means there is a flat plane. A flat plane means stop using gradients. And not using gradients invites you to make better choices with your brushes later on when you're blocking in. Blocking in is really important because it makes your brush work large and working large to small is the best way to control the general form and deconstruct any reference you're ever going to work with. All of this process makes you see the geometries before seeing the symbols. Symbols are okay but at the very very end and as long as they don't interrupt the function in the anatomy. That's it. That's all pretty much that's all the fundamentals we're dealing with right now. And just go back, rewind this video, and just write that down in your notes and post it up on your wall, and you'll never forget it. <clears throat> so this is a 14-day challenger, and I'm not sure why um, you're working in a tile. Maybe no one told you that you're supposed to be working in a <clears throat> in a portrait, so to invite um, like a less of a of a stumped or a, what's the stunted? There we go, stunted. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I'm, I've lost words. I'm in so much pain. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're doing here is the head, very, very round, and too round, right? What happens with the head is it squares off on the sides. All right, a human head just doesn't work like this. The reason why I did it in a different layer is so I don't have to last all on the other side and waste your time. There we go. 
Okay, so that's off. And a good start, we have a nice square side. And remember, the cranium is a combination, if we were to break down its geometric anatomy, the cranium um, is a combination of a dome, which is a sphere right at the top, which is why this radial shading is so wonderful, and then two sharp edges from the square leading into the temples. So we have a better understanding of the cube in case one day, which we have to, we might need to rotate this, and rotating a cube is much e easier than rotating a head. Write that back to me. Again, that's another role the form plays and geometry plays in our ability to pull off a good portrait. That's another role form studies play. If you rotate a cube, you can rotate a head. And so that's why it's good to identify where the cube is. And if you're cutting off some of the cube and drawing a cranium that, that goes all the way down to the temples and the ears, and it's no longer a cranium, it's just a, it's not human anymore. If you look at the skeleton of a, like a skull of a human, it's very, very angular. It's good to capture that in your form studies if, um, and uh, your 14-day your challenge. You get all that anatomy business out of the way. Right, it's easier to rotate a cube than it is to rotate a head. And that's why we do form studies. All right, so there's that little issue. And then to do with the eyebrows, a lot of students do this. By the way, for those who graduated the 14-day challenge, if I haven't critiqued you yet on the live stream, just message me on Facebook with your 14th day. And if I have time to fit it in or if I am doing a 14-day challenge theme, I will take a look at your work. You just got to message me on, on, uh, on Facebook. So another problem is the fact that you guys over-outline the eyebrows. I'm not sure why the eyebrows are so exempt from being underneath any kind of shadow. I don't know why. I'm still trying to figure out why, for some reason, our brains make you paint around the eyebrow and not on top of it. Sorry, one sec. Okay, so that means that you guys are painting around the eyebrow. Anything, anything but going over this hill. I mean, I feel like you guys are thinking your brush is a car. And you're like, oh shit, it's a whole little trench. It's a valley. Let's just drive around it. And just continue on the other side. <laughs> You guys are actually supposed to be doing this. Why do you guys think your brush is a car? Your brush is not a car. It's not a tiny little vehicle traveling on top of a... It's good to think like that when we're thinking about contour lines, but right now it's it's not that. All right, stop, stop allowing this eyebrow to have a halo around it that completely throws off the genetic... Or not the gen... Yeah, the, gen, the gen, basic genetics of the human skeleton. So we're throwing off the realism by throwing off that uh, anatomy. And we're just completely just bringing in this focal importance to the eyebrows it just is not proportionate to what the eyebrows do. <laughs> All right? When we're looking at people, we don't look at their eyebrows, we look at their eyes. So any, any kind of outlining or any extra makeup or highlight we put around the eyes, we put just a little bit on the eyebrows just to make them feel more um, sculpted. But, uh, yeah, the eyebrow inherits the light of the object it sits on. Basically, what came first, the eyebrow bone or the eyebrow? You ask a student, they'll tell you that every single little hair was, was made first in the mother's womb and, <laughs> and then the, the skeleton was made and then the skin. Or the skin first and then the skeleton. Oh, the skeleton's not important. Well, one of the first things that develops is just the basic stuff, the basic groundwork, and then you got the little hairs come after. So if you're shading as if the hairs came first, you're doing it wrong. And this is an example of shading as if the hairs came first. All right. And then we've got... Continue that M shape. So basically, for those who like little quick tips and easy ways to remember stuff, just an M. Look at that. A little M, like this. And if you have good notes from today's class and you post them to the class notes, I will give you my brushes. My very own brushes. I will give them to you. So if I see a nice little M in your notes and I see that someone out there has remembered this very, very important little thing, I will reward you with my little trinkets. <laughs> Um, isn't the shadow on the brow area too dark, or is it just me? Um, this eye, eye socket area here? Well, not really. No, not really. Um, you've got bigger issues to deal with than than the no than the than the eye. Sorry, the nose is what you have to deal with next. So we fix that. The eyebrows feel a little bit overdrawn. So I'm going to use one of my smudge tools. I'm going to use this one, number one, <laughs> and I'm just going to blend away areas that are part of the eyebrows. Uh, eyebrow, eyebrow bones shadow, the hairs under there don't really get an outline. You see what I just did? I blended this theme. I'm also going to blend it out here. And I 
and I'm just going to blend it over here. We don't want to overdraw the eyebrows. We just want them to kind of just sit there out of the way, nice and under rendered. Remember, when we look at a face in the real world, we're not looking at it like a camera does. We're seeing one thing at a time. We even see one eye at a time. We don't look at both eyes at the same time. Once you notice this, you really can't unnotice it. It's, it's, really, <laughs> it's really messed up. Kind of made me panic the other day. I was just looking at Abu's eyes and he's got these big brown eyes and I'm just like, why can't I see them both at the same time? <laughs> it was really messing with me and you never really look at someone, do you? You never, they never really look you in the eyes and you never look them in the eyes. It's, it's weird. You know, that when their eyes look at one of your eyes, it's which one are you going to look at and they both don't really share one line of vision. They're both kind of, like you can't make one eye share one line of it unless you close one eye. So you never really look at one thing, you never really look at everything at the same time, you're looking at one thing at a time, meaning that anything that is not eyes, there's always one eye that's a little bit more anyway, but anything, let's say, that's not eyes is going to be periphery vision. Everything that's not eyes is periphery. Everything that's not eyes is not the focus. So that's why we under-render the eyebrows. That's why we don't bring in every little texture that a camera sees. Just because a camera sees it doesn't mean it's right when you do it. You want to paint as if you're not a photorealist painter, you're not a human printer. Right? I don't even consider that an art because you're just you're just copying pixel for pixel. What you want to do is paint as if you, you're seeing this person with the naked eye. You want to paint as if you're seeing with the naked eye. And that's why we lower contrast around the eyes. We, we, we decrease detail around the eyes, etc. <clears throat> All right, so beautiful job around the eye shapes themselves. Really, really good job. I have no problems with the with the eye at all. It's beautiful. Um, a couple issues with the nose, and I feel like you need some more form studies, especially so close to day 13. You pretty much should have been on your edge work and your contrast and a little bit closer to bringing in hair and color. Um, so that means that the nose is a little bit of a day 2 or a day 3 nose. That's saying something. And when I say these things, it's not to insult, it's not to uh, discourage, it's just an honest diagnosis for something you need to work on as soon as possible and that's some basic forms that help you express the nose a little bit better. Some basic anatomy as well. The septum is lower than the nostrils, pointing down like a V shape. And the sides of the nose kind of move in this direction. They don't blend over blend into the sides of the face and this is what I mean when we say, when I say we bring in a gradient, but a gradient that's not so large it breaks the geometric anatomy. We do bring in a gradient in this little edge that I created here. And we identify the fact that, hey, this nose is just a little bit wide for a woman. Especially because we're trying to learn the, uh, the ideal until further notice. And what I'm doing right now is just I'm identifying where the geometric anatomy is of the nose. And we see that by bringing in some edge work this sides of the nose, these sides here were a little bit too dark. And again, another role geometric anatomy plays in how well, what the choices we make with our brushes. And that's it, guys. That's all it is. If I die, <laughs> that's my legacy. Study your shapes. You'll be able to break down any reference. You'll be able to remember better. I'm sorry I'm talking like this. I'm just in so much pain. I should probably edit all this shit out. I hate being a little bitch. I always talk about pain and pain. All right, so I'm probably going to edit that little bit out just now, so I'm going to have to seam this in a little better. Okay, so onward <laughs> to the to the sides of the nose. Whenever a cast shadow is cast, it is determined, its, it's darkness is determined by what's receiving it. So that means that her skin is very pale. It's receiving a cast shadow that should be a little bit more light. When it starts to look like a Hitler mustache, that's when we need to take a step back. <clears throat> sculpt it, don't over blend it, exactly. And when we blend it, let's say we said, okay, I want to blend this, blend it, but don't blend it away so much that you lost exactly what you were doing with the sides of the nose here. And besides, the sides of the nose are almost always over rendered and over expressed and over detailed and over outlined and over shadowed and over contrast and it's just, it's not good for the nose. Right here, this whole area should cut off. You don't connect. Okay, a lot of you are doing this and this is another example of that eyebrow instance. You guys for some reason do this and you guys always do it. You guys grab the color, the value on the lower part of the nose which is 
cut off by if you did the geometric anatomy and you did the actual shape of the nose and you watched my nose video in which I explained thoroughly what goes into drawing a nose a realistic nose and how to read it off a reference <clears throat> you this line is a border and you just don't cross it but a lot of you just grab this value and just start painting around the nostril as if it belongs there no this is looking up at the light so what it's gonna do is just completely stop okay it doesn't just keep going it doesn't just go around the border and, and kind of like hide in the bushes. Wait, that sounded <laughs> racist. Um, yeah, it doesn't sneak around the border. No, I'm not saying this in regards to any group of people. I mean, there's areas around the Canada-US border that have zero security. I mean, people are always going in and out of there. Anyway, got to edit that part out too. Fuck. All right, got to make this seamless. So basically just bring in this uh, this 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 shadow and stop it only here and then bring in the light right at the point where the nostrils start to look up at the light and again this goes back to <clears throat> knowing where things look up and which things look down remember that bit that's that's to do with this and what I'm doing here is I'm edging out the sides that your your size is a little low your image size image size tiny you're not gonna get the full effect of the brushes that you buy and the brushes that you make if your canvas is this tiny maybe because you uploaded it this small I don't know but, uh, but you get better edges when you have a larger canvas I always recommend 3000 by 3000 my brushes all my brushes are designed on a 3000 by 3000 canvas so if you have my brushes and you want to use them the way I made them then uh, work with a size like that and this edge right here a little sharp just like that and then we just blend this bit away in this area we can blend it to kingdom come because it's a fatty pocket and these fatty pockets are really smooth they have no density no backbone and they just have that uh, little bit. Then we talk about the cheeks, and the cheeks look like they have a beard. Um, and that's because you are kind of using too much darkness too soon, especially for a female's face. So I brought that down entirely. And you seem to have really like selected zones where you just don't have value. She's either pale or tan. And you gotta start finding a mid-ground. So what I'm gonna do is just go to the easiest value to work with, which is just giving them a medium tan skin tone and then bringing the highlights only where they're needed. I'll do this in a new layer. Darken. I'm going to try to do everyone's lesson, uh, everyone's piece that I chose today because I'm not sure if I'll make it on Thursday, <clears throat> depending on when I start getting ready to go. So I got a new layer, and I'm going to start off with anything that has a specularity to it. I erase that away. So anything watery. And then we go to the nose basic light spots not too much erasing I still want to keep some of that mid-tone and then we've got the before which feels like she's pale but has too much bronzer on around her face so now it feels a little bit less like that it feels like that's her skin tone okay and then I'm just going to decrease that a touch and then I will do the same thing but meet it halfway with the highlights so I'm going to grab this value Get into lighten mode and just lighten the cheek. Your values are very separated. Another thing that doing form studies might help you with. Your values weren't expressing the same skin tone. And doing some more spheres and circles might actually help you as well in making better values and making a better beard shadow as I call it. You also had another highlight in, the, in a halo around the, uh, around the lips another example of you know symbolic that's why we, we we overdraw the highlight and we get that little car and drive around the eyebrow because this is a symbol when we think eyebrow we think symbol we don't want to put any gross shadows on top of it it's a symbol it's doing just fine on its own why should I include it with any shadows that's the thinking of a student and that's wrong um, no shit it's okay I'll make it bigger image size 2000. Alright, so before 
after. So let me see if I can snap this in place. There we go. Before, after. Basic stuff you should have ironed out around day five, day six. But again, I mean, like, you're not getting exactly, like, the perfect, the most perfect critique every time. But the point is of this, of this community is if you're not getting critique, start giving some critiques. People will go back and give you critique. If you're doing a 14-day challenge and you're not getting enough of an exposure for, for each challenge day, um, start being more active in other people's 14-day challenge, uh, challenges. And the more people you're active with, the more you'll get notice, noticing your work. I did a whole video about dark skin. It's in my history. Is the recess before the chin too long? No, I don't really worry about like the distance of the nose and the mouth and the mouth to the eyes. As long as everything is generally proportionate and it's pretty if you were going for pretty and it's ugly if you were going for ogre or whatnot. I don't really, sometimes I see people with really long chins. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I, I would work on the radial shading. So you do have instances here where you could have shaded radially, but you just don't have that. A couple of pages full of blobs and that would have helped you. Also, this area of the lower eye is too perfect. Bring in some wrinkles, natural, healthy, younger people wrinkles. You don't have to be old to have that. Over-rendering the eyebrows and overdrawing them. Again, another example of symbolic memory. <clears throat> All right, so lots of form talk. And that's why I like having these uh, before we get into the colored stuff. Let's jump into this one and use Portrait Studio real quick to find the exact lighting situation we're dealing with here. So the eyes are crossed a little bit too much and the lighting is just a little bit wonky. It's just a little bit, it's responding to do two different situations. So uh, we're looking at something that's a little bit more like this. Just looking at the shadow, the sides of the nose. Thing is you have like this, uh, so it's like behind the face as well. I'm not really sure how you got this lighting situation. Hmm. Turn this one off. Turn this on. Raise its brightness up. Raise the spread. You want me to see it. And then just push it inward. Even then, even then it's just a little bit too... Uh, feels like it's behind by a little bit. Maybe this one would work. And I'll just de decrease the strength or decrease the brightness. Yeah, this one might work actually. I'm just looking at the bounce light, looking at what's happening to the lips. So you have no indication of cast shadow around the eye socket. This whole area here would just be revealed to the light. You'd, you had this, I'm following the nose shadow you had. Um, the light would have had to be behind the head and if it was behind the head the chin wouldn't have gotten any. So what we're doing right now is we're using this reference right here to figure out. Let me try to do it with the universal instead. That way we get more believable cast shadows. Excuse me. Yeah, this one seems a little bit more appropriate, and I'm just following the shadow you had here. So you have a little bit too much light here on the side. The bounce light is okay, I guess, because there's bounce light here, but even then I would darken it just a touch. And then you've got the fact that the forehead has light on it as if the light was top-down, as if the light was that normal top-down light source that we do. This one. And that's the kind of light you have on the forehead. So you have about three different light source situations here, especially look at this cast shadow. This cast shadow is pointing up at the face, meaning the light source is coming from down here. It should have been pointing down. So you've got like, I don't know, three or four different light sources working on the face. And um, a lot of stuff goes into why we make this mistake. This is usually how I teach, like I show you what the problem is and wonder why and what the thinking process is behind it. When we try to deconstruct the thinking process, we find what, which study to, to do, um, which study to complete in order to best avoid this in the future. And it always goes back to form studies, but form studies alone, um, treating it like, you know, knowing where the light source is, doing the right planes, doing gradients, 
isn't sometimes enough for a student that is so early in the way they behave with light or the way they think of light. So sometimes it's just it's just a good practice to just grab a, a reference, pretty face. Okay. Go to images and just uh, I don't know, anybody. And just start drawing some planes, areas that you think are just part of the upward facing and the lower face. Sometimes it's not even about light anymore. Sometimes you shouldn't try to do the shading yourself. You're just not there yet. It's just about finding, like, getting a good red line and just drawing the general shape. You think that the nose, the, ge the geometric anatomy of the nose, of the eyes, of the face, just identifying where these borders are. It goes down to even that, where you don't even paint anymore because painting would be too damaging to the whether or not you're going to retain all this information. <clears throat> so there's all of that. And then there is the fact that the eyes are crossed a little bit. Really crossed. So yeah, we cross them for the sake of having a focus, but we just don't, you know, overdo it. Let me decrease the density. That's a hell of a lot of density. Let me just zoom out. And mostly what we do with eyes to get them to look a little better is we focus one eye to look at us, and then we kind of zoom out or look at the forehead while we move the other one, or look at this one, or look at this eye, eye just and zoom out and look over here to see if they look right. Just looking at this nose area. So they look a little bit less crossed now. Crossed is good sometimes for that cute eye, that Bambi eye. Um, but again, you don't want to overdo it and just make them look like they have, you know, not really functional eyes. Anything where the eyes are not visible or there's something shading the eyes or hiding the eyes or keeping the eyes from view of someone you know, was on the street and you could barely see their eyes, you wouldn't trust them because you just can't see their eyes. I mean, it's not just because their face is hidden, but just something's wrong with their eyes. Someone looks sickly or villainous um, when we did that w that week on villains. If you haven't caught up with that, please do, because we cover so much on portraiture when it came to the villains. We, we just pretty much did everything. And we were talking about what makes it uncomfortable, what makes a face uncomfortable to look at. And that's when we're doing weird stuff with the eyes. We're hiding them, we're shading them, there's too much black, there's not enough white in the eyes, that the white of the eye is invisible. And there's a trust factor when we see the whites of the eyes. Um, great job on the nostrils of the nose, but uh, the, the outer edges of the lips need some shadow. So I'm just blocking these in. And then now I'm going to try to find where these cast shadows are that we found when we use Portrait Studio. By the way, if you don't have Portrait Studio, if you're interested in getting it, um, it's on my website at isdirect.com. And for those who are um, who do have it, uh, Form Studio and everything that I showed in my last update video, if you haven't seen that, please go watch it. Um, all of that uh, will be included, I've decided, will be included in Portrait Studio. It will not be a side edition. We might release it as a side edition at a later time and we might in introduce a light version of Portrait Studio which doesn't give you like many uh, many of the features of course. It's very just a light version but for those who can't afford it, who can't ever afford it, um, we're gonna have that option available for you. But for now the update of Form Studio which is a little branch used just for form studies um, it's going to be available in Portrait Studio so it'll be part of the updates that you get when you buy it, you pretty much buy all the updates and versions coming up. There's no extra fee for updating or anything like that. But yeah, it's no longer a, um, it, it might be, it's a for sure. I'm just going to get rid of this cast shadow and I'm trying to find the trail of these cast shadows. They leave behind these beautiful little footprints, these gorgeous footprints, and they're just all, 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 all that it is. Life is just about finding these beautiful cast shadows. Look at that. Fuck. Sorry. <laughs> Just having a moment here with these shadows. Uh, this whole area will get subsurface scattering on it. The light is in a situation where we get some subsurface scattering. All right, this is tricky. Basically what it is, is just anywhere we would have a shadow, we're just having a little bit of light. All right, so I'm just going to overdo it and I'm going to get into a new layer. 
and then erase away what I overdid because dodge tool is a, is a good tool it tries hard but it's a bit of a bitch and it doesn't listen to you when you need it to gives you what you need but it's like a sandwich that you you know it's your it's the kind of sandwich you want to eat but it's just got that ingredient that you just don't want to eat that day but in order to get the stuff you want to eat you have to go through that ingredient that's pretty much what I mean <laughs> like like I love pickles but some people hate pickles yeah I'm trying to sound like an old lady now <laughs> so senile this pain is making me so fucking senile yeah pickles ladies and gentlemen Pull out the pickles. Alright. So I'm just going to assess whether or not I need it to be this this light. And it's to do with how much of this cast shadow is. Because it's translucent, that's why we get subsurface scattering. This shadow doesn't get to be that dark. So it lightens up just a little bit. And then I would rather not have it be so, so subsurface scattery. Just a little less. And I'm going to carry some of that right here into march down march down right here into this okay and then right now it's leaving behind a really icky uh dodge tool orange i'm gonna fix that in a second i love your analogy <laughs> forms illustrated <laughs> you guys remember that one of you promised me you would make a forms illustrated illustrated cover for me and you never did you guys are liars you promised me. This direct likes pickles, exactly. <laughs> Someone promised me they'd make me a Sports Illustrated mock. Did they? Did they end up doing it? I don't remember. Alright, so I'm just uh, fixing that. A little bit of this side nose here is going to get some light. And the above space here. Remember that the geometric anatomy of a mouth is a cylinder. And so the cylinder will be like light, dark, light, dark, just two cylinders stacked on each other. And so that means that we've got light, excuse me, light, and then dark, and then light, and then dark halfway. On the halfway marker, it's not just about it being light all the way to the edge of the lip, because that's thinking symbolically again. <clears throat> Didn't they do it like two years ago? I don't remember. <laughs> Was it very sexy? Nice. Sexy form. Okay. And then again, we have a cast shadow off the chin. And to know which direction all the cast shadows move in, just make them all point in the same direction. Just as a rule of thumb. They do sometimes point in different directions depending on the contour of the object. But, uh, yeah, the eyes are very symbolic here. You got a bit of a symbolic eye, um, which is a bit troublesome altogether. It's keeping the face back. It's keeping from everything from feeling real. Uh, the face itself is just a little bit uncanny. It's hard to get a hold of whether or not it's a woman or a man. And you, people might be trending into that movement lately, but in a portfolio, that shows nothing but weakness. And, um... Like, I, yes, I just uh, blew my nose. <laughs> um, well, not really blue. <clears throat> but, yeah, it's, it's, it's representing it as a form of disability rather than skill. If you can't paint a woman or a man, if you can't render that to be recognizable, if your genders are not recognizable and leave everyone kind of feeling a little uneasy, it's not good for your portfolio, period. That's it. You can't try to change the population, all right? You can't try to change the way people have under basic understanding of binary genders and the familiarity. And sometimes a writer comes in and hires you to draw for them a, a, a male protagonist. They're going to want a male protagonist. They're not going to hire you. They're not going to change their vocabulary to match yours. They're not going to change their the way they understand genders to match yours. At this point, you're just totalitarian and trying to do that. So if you are a gender person, um, if you're all about that and you don't believe in, in genders, um, um, uh, please ad address the fact that if you want to take this job seriously, if you ever want to do get hired, you want to take it into a non-hobby format and want to be taken seriously in that respect, you have to start figuring out what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman. So you have a lot of signatures here that are making him way too androgynous. 
and uh, it's making the audience just a little bit, making it a little bit difficult for them to recognize the character or read something out of the character. So some basic light changes, and they're all basic, but a lot of thought went into them, didn't they? And the difference between a student who does this and this is a bunch of form studies. Just this little change needs a lot of form studies. Imagine from the difference between a beginner and a professional, just hours and hours of work, but you can do it efficiently. Um, and uh, there's no need for you to have to waste another six years figuring out whether or not cast shadows are right for you. Trust me, they're good for you. They're really good for you. And the crossing of the eyes, the reason why it looks uncanny, if I were to point some to you, is the corners are too high. This is a female face. The nose is a little bit too uh, delicate. It's a very feminine nose and also just a little bit big. The mouth is very, very effeminate. Um, the jawline is almost non-existent. It usually just exists down here somewhere. The neck is very thick compared to all this delicacy in the features. And then we've got the elf ears just to top it all off. Um, so you're removing a lot of the familiarity in the human, the genders that, the, that separate humans and, um, you know, humans from each other in the painting. And, uh, yeah, I think a little bit of the light over here. You do have a flat eyebrow, which is helping along, helping me along and in seeing the male instead. But, um, because usually females do that. But yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Maybe bring in a little bit more rigidity to the size of the nose, have it catch a little bit more light shrink the size of the eyes, tilt them down, study some eyes, study more realistic eyes. You've got these like corners here. And these corners are making it look very symbolic of an eye. Especially if you went for such a realistic nose. That's kind of why it's um, a little confusing. And you went for that light source that was very extreme. So you just bit more than you could chew, I think. And uh, getting rid of the hair, getting rid of the all these accessories, I call them confusers are going to help you focus your attention back to where you really need some help. And it's in the, all the mechanics and all the functions of the portrait. Okay, so there's that. And then, I'm really, really having Antares <laughs> wait for his. You're earning this, this critique, Antares. You're earning it. <laughs> oh, it's a dude? Okay, it's a dude. Okay, so for this piece here, uh, the student expressed that they do need to do a 14-day challenge. I read their little blurb. And um, a couple of things are standing in the way of this. Reading is beautiful. I like that they had the angle here. You had a style, stylized eye, but it was a it was a realistic stylized eye, meaning that it was actually sculpted. We, we didn't see the further corner, did we? It's not like a front view eye. I would push this just a little bit more inward. But this eye puff, this downward angle on the eyes, this line, and the distance of this eye from this, this mouth from the nose has made her look like she's probably in her 60s. Or she was a smoker all her life and she's 40 years old. By the way, if you smoke, stop it. So what I'm going to do, okay, is I'm going to tilt this eye upward. I'm going to leave the hood. Maybe she's Asian. Well, maybe she is because of the Japanese eh? And then I'm going to raise the uh, the lips upward, the corner of the lips, so not so much to have her smiling. And then I'm going to give the upper lip a little bit more plumpness, just so that when when old people age, uh, when people age, they they kind of lose the plumpness of the mouth, so it kind of sags and implodes, and that's why we have a thinner mouth, a thinner lip for older people. Okay, and I'm making these a little bit more symmetrical, and you'll see in a second now she looks a little less old. The nostril is a little bit more visible. Man, my liquify is just so stupid right now. And I'm giving the nose a little bit more strength. And again, the nose kind of, the nose keeps growing, by the way, when we get older. And then we've got all this over here. So now she looks a little younger, and that along with this, that I'm just going to smudge it instead of touching your values. She looks great. And I'm going to smudge this away. I'm going to show you the before and after really quick and show you, holy shit, show you what you did. <laughs> Damn, I thought I lost. Alright, so before, after. So actually, before I do that, I forgot about this sag right here. 
That's another reason why she looked old. That was a little extensive. And the eye was closed-ish. But that's kind of why she's she looks retrospective and kind of emotionless and apathetic. But she's probably like a super badass, sword-wielding badass hero. And they usually are coolest when they have no emotion <laughs> expressed. Um, trust me, I'm a fan of that too. But for the sake of the age, you don't want them to look like they're old. And they're badass unless you were going for that intentionally. Never draw accidental age. Never have accidental age. There's just too much information out there to help you not do that. Right, write that back to me. Don't accidentally draw an old person. <laughs> Make sure it's intentional. Make sure you want to. Alright, so she still looks apathetic and badass, but not old apathetic and badass. And then I'm radially introducing this edge with a little cast shadow. Oops, this one's too strong. I'm using the number two. Number two, yes. This one. I think I'm, yeah, I'm going to use the number three smudger. And I'm just smudging away at this. And when I smudge away, I'm smudging for the sake of that upward uh, gradient. But I'm going to go back and reestablish the, the, the trench of the fold right along here. Always go back and draw it in. Don't accidentally draw old people. <laughs> Don't draw accidental age. That's exactly what I mean. And then before I get into the before and after, um, I just want to mention that this value is the same as this value, which is wrong. This face has portions of it that turn away slowly from the light, meaning we result in a, in a circular kind of radial depression and recession into the shadow realm. Um, let me uh, let me connect the chin a little closer to the mouth so it doesn't look masculine. It still looks like a female. And tuck that in. And then we have before. Do you see that old age? After. Exactly the same face you drew, except it's a little more young, like her minus 20 years. All right, I'm going to raise this corner up to show you the beauty in, in raising the corner up. You see that? She looks even younger. So we don't have that sag anymore. You don't have shadows on the lower part of the nose, which is bad. Oh my lord, I think my neighbor's cooking tuna. Yep, he's cooking tuna. Every time he cooks tuna, <laughs> I can tell in my office. Um, damn, I think he burned tuna. Okay, so I'm just darkening this so we can have a shadow. And of course, it's not a geometric block of a person. We still have to blend these away. And then we've got the lower eyelid, which is non-existent. And then we've got the fact that we need the presence of the light source, which is a white yellow. Especially if she's pale, an Asian pale, which is a very white value. It's a very colorless grayscale in the lightest lights. And we're just placing that and blocking it in on all the major areas that are exposed to that light source. And then we just go back in. The skin is reflective. The skin is it's going to reflect major characteristics of the light source because it's pale and colorless and it's oily. So it's going to reflect the nature of the light source. I don't know why my computer is screaming. A little bit over here. Sorry if you hear that hum in the background. There's really nothing I can do. And I really don't like this Yeti, this Yeti uh, mic. I liked how close I was to the mic before with my Logitech headset, but because there's a ground loop where I live, they're always going to hear that buzzing sound, so that's why the Yeti works better, because it doesn't connect to the computer the way that Logitech one did. But because of that, you guys are going to forever hear the, my background fans and the air filter and my computer fan. I tried messing with the game, but it didn't really help. All right, so before, 
after. I'm not sure you were intending this age. I'm not sure you were intending for this old, um, kind of like ogre mouth. I'm not sure you were intending. I think you were going for something like this. But because we don't have a vocabulary in age groups and signatures of age, we don't notice when we're making mistakes with them. All right? It's like learning trying to speak another language without ever having any training in another language. You're going to make mistakes. You're, you're going to make mistakes. If you can't speak the language, you simply don't, don't under, you see nothing, you hear nothing when someone starts speaking in that language. I also recommend some kind of, I mean, if you wanted to, you can. It feels a little bit nice when you have like blocked values. But because you shade it everywhere, I feel like you don't want to. But you might want to make this horn a little bit closer to her skin tone, the closer it gets to her skin tone. Okay. So there's that. Hope that helps you. Any questions? Um, the cheekbone looks nice now. The after is amazing. Thank you. Uh, shouldn't the eye be somewhat closer to the nose? The eye was very stylized. It was very stylistic. Uh, so it, uh, it, I didn't want to touch it too much because you were going, but you made it realistically rotated even though it was, um, yeah. <laughs> no joke, every before and after announcement, even outside class, I hear it and say it in this direct voice. Before? Um, Mr. Rock's going to start a cooking critique class on the side. <laughs> Burn tuna for tuna. <laughs> I know, everyone always overcooks tuna. You don't even have to cook. Everyone always overcooks fish. You know, you can cook a fish in like 30 seconds in some boiling water. Did you know? Anyway. What kind of brushes do I use for smudging? Um, before I get into Antares, I'm just going to delay his critique even more. <laughs> just tease him like that. Um, all my brushes are available on my store on my website. Um, so my latest brushes are the smudging brushes. These are, these are the ones that I'm using for blending paired with smudge tool. Um, so yeah, on Photoshop, of course. I'm sorry that I don't have Krita and other kinds of brushes. Okay, so let's get started. Mistakes are opportunities to improve, though. No, of course. Of course, whoever said they weren't. My mom makes a mean fish, but of that because of that rule, I don't overcook the fishy. Yeah, uh, this rack if, uh, is going to announce she's out of time now. It's going to be the untouchable. <laughs> um, so I'm out of time now. It's six oh seven. I will take care of you <laughs> next time. And Tara's first in the line. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, so every time I look at this bad boy, beautiful drawing by the way, lovely lighting have a couple of issues with it. My favorite, of course, as you know, you could have guessed, it's the cast shadow. But it's the fact that this entire fin, this entire tail, is directly exposed to the light source in equal, um, in the, in equal degree all the way down. You had a tail of a fish. You had a mermaid tail and you didn't take advantage of, you know, having the, the I'm going to be extra hard on you uh, because you're one of the higher, higher skill level artists in this community. So... Damn, Antares, you had the opportunity to show some some badass folding and, and real, uh, uh, what are they, what are they called, gestures, and you didn't go for it, bro? No. This guy, he seems to be, his mascot is this snake, and the snake is doing a little bit of a loop-de-loop, but he's so stationary compared to her. No, you don't do it like that. Just because you had extra little contrast here doesn't mean it forgives you. I mean, uh, gesture here doesn't mean it forgives you from having it here. You should have went for it. You should have went for the chance to show how this tail kind of just overlaps itself into the distance. It was a tiny little shrimp tail before. And you could have done a little bit more with the shape. So you could have had a little bit more overlap. And he could have made it longer. It felt like a tiny little shrimp tail compared to this massive fish behind him. This fish could have kicked his ass. Just because he hasn't tried it, this fish doesn't give a damn. All it sees is a tiny little shrimp it's going to eat. It needs to have some kind of strength and, and you know, represented in its form and its musculature. And that tiny little tail wasn't doing much. 
So you start it off a little thicker, and you thin it out the further you go. And I have a couple of uh, suggestions on the face as well. Let me see if I can do this for you guys real quick, like, so you don't have to wait too long. Direct time to use your radial shading powers. Cast shadow, bam. And bam. Radial recession, bam, bam. Cast shadow, bam. And then recession there. Look at that. That's what I want to see. Okay, and then we have this have some minor degree of highlight to it. Very small, nothing excessive, nothing to break its 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 uh, strength as a shadow. And then we've got the fact that it's in shadow, so this edge cannot contest anything that is outside. And we've got the fact that it's receding into the distance, so we've got a little bit more atmospheric fade. Pew pew! <laughs> exactly. All right, Antares. So I expect more from you. I expect better from you, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm probably tormenting him. I'm sorry, buddy. So I merge that down there. I'm gonna fix up this little angle with a nice hard brush. Again, another solid brush, another uh, blocking brush from my dry oil brushes. And I call them dry oil because I design them as if they have very little paint on them. All right, so there's that. And there's cast shadow from this fin. I want it to be a little bit more strong. Eh, it's so hard to pull it off without interrupting the recession. <clears throat> Issa used cast, sh cast shadow. It was super effective. <laughs> okay. And then there's the fact that on him, on his person, there's a bunch of green but the light that I'm reading off of this is a little bit more white and turquoise. So he should have gone all turquoise under the light source as well, because that's that yellow from the light source coming in, interrupting a lot of the green on him. All right, so we want him to be a little bit more involved with the light source nearby. Sometimes if you're doing these uh, really strong pieces, very, very, very saturated pieces, you tend to lose a little bit, you fall off a little bit with some of the more important saturation belts, and that's fine, especially if you have to color and value and shade and make the gesture look great, and you have to keep track of the light source. All that is very extensive. You seem to have a bit of a tangent with the placement of the collarbones and the cast shadow, so I'm going to go ahead and extend this cast shadow. That tangent is very awkward. Tangent just means the edge of the cast shadow was the edge of the collarbones, and it was really, really awkward. So I'm just extending that cast shadow a little bit more. And then there's his face, which is really, really detailed, but it's in a very, very, like, it's only like, the, what, like 10%, not even, like 2% of the, of the, the canvas. So you need to really start, you know, pulling some mileage on the face. If he's angry and he's tough, go for it. You have very, very little opportunity here to express his, his, uh, who, what he is, which is the big space fish man, king of the depth, not from outer space. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to darken and make him look a little bit more tough. There we go. We're reading it from a distance now. And then I know you want to do this whole fish lip, but you don't want to make him look old. So you got to find the middle ground. You want to make him look hot and sexy. I mean, look at that body. <laughs> So that means that we have to just get this to be a little bit closer, okay? It's still going to have the same mouth, don't worry. We have not muted your artistic voice. We've enhanced it, We're trying to express that he's some sort of sex god of the sea. <laughs> um, and he wasn't really reading as a sex god with his mouth sagging to gravity like that. All right? I know you were going for that fish thing. But I've seen that fish design a lot, and I've seen it in like Futurama or something. And it, 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 it looks very funny very fast if it turns into an actual fish mouth. Like if it turns into an actual, like, fish mouth, you know? You don't want to do that. Especially if he has a human nose, like a full-on human, like, Grecian god nose, like a Herculean nose. 
you don't want to extend it down here. It's going to look very, very funny. So what you want to do is keep it close, follow all the rules. It's just that he's a little bit more frowny and he's got a little bit more over here. Handsome fish. <laughs> Okie dokie. I would bring in more contrast here if you're comfortable with it. You just have to gauge where you're going everywhere else. You don't want to overdo it. But because this level and this this fish and this fin, this part of the fish and this fin tail are all on the same level, they get the same amount of atmospheric fade. And then we have all this necessary contrast. If there's got to be this contrast, and some of this might be allowed to. So you just have to zoom out and gauge it. And this side of the fish here would need more black. Here would need more black because he's getting pretty dark and high contrast. But then suddenly, right under the waistline, there's no contrast. So we need to see some equal contrast and just have it recede the lower we go. Do you have any questions, Antares? Do you have any questions for me, Doggo? Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out the area I'm going to be bringing in the contrast. Better before and after for you. I am going to go ahead and use Burn Tool to save me some time. Maybe not Burn Tool on Shadows. <clears throat> fish don't have umbilical cords. Only an Easter egg stream with the word fish nipples ever appear. <laughs> well, maybe he doesn't need nipples. But the thing is, just because he's a fish doesn't mean that he doesn't get some of the human features. Humans don't have fins, but there they are. So he can have nipples, he can have, the way I see it, he can have um, umbilical cords. Maybe he was born with an umbilical cord. He's not a full fish, is he? Is he? No. Ever since I got my car, I've pretty much turned into an old person, always worried someone's out there messing with my car. <laughs> and there are these asshole college kids who take my parking spot all the time, and I just get so fucking mad. I'm just like, why would you park right in front of my door, you asshat? There's like, there's like, it's just a basic rule, park in the order of your apartments. I mean, I don't understand. I think my neighbor really burned his, uh, his tuna. I hear him fanning out his door outside. So yeah, I've pretty much turned into a cranky old <laughs> lady. <laughs> I want to take care of my car. All right, grabbing some of that white on the fin. And then lastly, we've got the subsurface scattering on the fins just around here. And you might want to bring in a different color for that. I'm not going to mess with that right now. Okay, so you're going to see before how it looked a little bit... Um, shrimp-like his tail. And I'm going to bring in a little bit more reflectivity, high contrast reflectivity on the on the tail. And some more. Along the body. He is reflective and scaly, I'm sure. before, after. You get more read from this distance and you decided to make it about the fish and him, which is a wonderful concept. I mean, he feels like the ocean feels big around him, which is good. But at this point, it's not so much that it's turned into, um, you know, like a, like a tiny little object. We still see enough of the person and we can appreciate him. But he's still very, very small. You see how modified he was before? It was like he was above water. His face was pretty neutral. He was like, yeah, I'm right here. Take a picture. But uh, we want to be able to express some of his personality from this distance so we can get a read. The best gestures, um, listen, when we're zoomed away from someone, let's say we're in like the nosebleeds of a ballet, we won't really be able to tell. I mean, everyone's always in some kind of nosebleed. Um, we, we, we don't tell, we can't really tell what's happening unless they exaggerate their poses. So if these ballerinas don't exaggerate 
what it means to find a little key on the ground. So they really have to be like, oh my god, a key! And they have to go for the key and get the key. They can't just be like, oh, it's a key, okay. That's good for zoom-ups, that's good for cameras, that's good for movies, that's good for when the audience is right there on the face. But when we're zoomed out and they're tiny little performers on the stage, you got to exaggerate everything they do. And you got to look at this through history. We've got Japanese operas, we've got um, those other operas, we've got those other opera, I forget what the operas were. The big ones, the ones where they have the faint, the fat ladies and the painted Italian operas and all that other renaissance stuff. Um, they all have exaggerated face paint, exaggerated expressions, exaggerated voices, exaggerated um, emotions, everything's so exaggerated just so the person from a distance can see it. Um, you've got everything over the top. So when we're talking about a character that is this far away, you really want to be able to make, like, make, make, make it count. And uh, exaggerating the poses will make it count. That along with his tiny little fish tail felt, it didn't feel as colossal as the behemoth behind him, as the sea creature behind him. He kind of has to keep his own take up enough space. So as a, as a character design, if I was the director, this looks comical to me. It doesn't mean just because he's a fish doesn't mean it has to be the same weight. It's not legs. It's not working leg legs. And if he's a king of kings, he's got to have a little bit like a tail like a king. It's all about size in the sea. Right. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope that helped you, Antares. Um, yeah, we learned that all in theater. You have to be very happy when happy, very sad when sad. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I feel like there's a tangent. Yeah, right about here, but I don't know. It's just the critique of what, what, uh, what he does with it is all um, up to him. Any questions? <laughs> uh, Sophia looks like an infinity symbol yeah it does doesn't it that's really cool nice burnt tuna I'm pretty sure that burning smell was you using the burn tool on that painting <laughs> oh very nice yeah <laughs> nice Casper damn I should have done that I think he added some particles in the water because blurry water equals a lot of life pollution particles of the deep. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, also, how do you feel about the distribution of detail in the piece? I tried to place it only on the focus points and keep the rest loose. At this point, Antares, you're sharing the focal point between him and her. So I suggest a little bit more excess contrast on her. Just around, just so that we can guide our eyes. So it's basically like loop-de-loop-de-loop. -loop de loop de loop de loop and then you're just stuck here so a couple of these fish right here are a little bit outside of it I recommend a fish or two more one fish here one fish here would be really cool right here and right here and a bit more detail leading into her eyes maybe give her a little bit more magic maybe combine show that she's his pet so that brightness in her eyes or the color in her eyes is the color on the stone on his trident then you really combine the two because right now I can read it as you know Yes, he's like a champion, but if you look at it in the right way, in a really picky way, um, you uh, you end up you end up seeing it like she's about to eat him, and he's just saying goodbye to his friends, <laughs> which all ditched him, and he's just looking at them like, "Wow, you fuckers!" And they all just ditched him, and she's like, "I'm gonna eat him," but that's just the drugs talking. Alaikum <clears throat> assalam. It's all about the size and the sea. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, good luck with all your work. I hope that this Thursday we can meet. Um, I'm going to try to. I've been in a lot of pain. I'm very sorry for it. I had a bunch of this information included in the video, the update video, but I just didn't want to make it about me anymore. But I feel like I've, I have to justify why I've been so blah lately and... I'm on a lot of painkillers because I have a bit of an injury on my back and I'm going through extensive imaging and specialists to deal with it and <clears throat> uh, I hate to say that a, a, a surgery is probably in the near future but probably not because those things just destroy your life. You can't even lift a laptop anymore they say once you have that surgery the implant in your back so um, it's going to get in the way of my workouts, which are my lifeblood. It's going to get in the way of art. It's going to get in the way of being able to sit down for long periods of time, which is my job, my livelihood. 
So again, I'm so sorry that my sentences have been slurred, that I've been late, that I've been um, just not myself. And I'm, I'm trying very hard, and I feel like I'm always on the mend. One thing fixes and another thing breaks. But I hope this is it. I hope this is the last one. <clears throat> and uh, But that was it. Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you liked what you saw today, um, just go to istabrak.com and go to the store if you wanted to get anything from there. Um, and to join the community, you just got to click, click on the Google Plus little icon here and join. Make sure you follow the rules. Please vote on the next poll. Okay, go to polls. Our next poll idea is right here. Yay, it's nearly winning. So I'm going to keep this going for another week. <laughs> um, just kidding. I don't want to show you guys which one I chose. <laughs> well, now you know. Uh, but uh, please go ahead and vote on which one you want to do. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a battle between Magical Companion and Robot Children. Post-apocalyptic robot children. Whatever you think you're going to submit for these, just get it out of your head because at the end I decide and write up the narrative. All right, I'm going to write up the brief. There's still a resource pack. By the way, you can get all the resource packs of the past challenges here. But I'm still going to be uploading a resource pack. So stop drawing them. Stop getting started. You don't draw your magical companion yet. It's, it's, I haven't assigned the brief yet. I'll give you time for it. Uh, but yeah, please vote. And um, But yeah, that's it. Thank you everyone for joining today. I'll talk to you guys next class. Bye.